team. He was all ACC for all three years that he played. Uh, he was an All-American in his senior year. And uh, he, I believe he still holds career rebounding records for University of Maryland, uh, both total rebounds and per game rebounds or per game average. Uh, and that's with only being able to play for three years because back when Len first started, freshmen were not allowed to play on the varsity team. So uh, let's see, Len went on to be a first round draft choice for the Washington Bullets in the NBA and also the Indiana Pacers in the ABA. Uh, he signed with the Pacers, uh, played 10 years in uh, the ABA and NBA after the merger uh, for a variety of teams. Uh, and after his playing career was over, he went to Harvard Law School. Uh, practiced law for many years. He was a district, an assistant district attorney in Brooklyn uh, for several years. Uh, he's been a sports agent. He, um, of course, has been a uh, college basketball uh, analyst on TV for uh, CBS, ESPN, Fox Sports, amongst others. Uh, and he also lectures at Columbia University um, in the sport and entertainment uh, uh, area. He, he teaches uh, some classes there. And I'll add, throw in um, probably a little known fact about Len. Uh, Len's wife is Jewish and his sons were both raised Jewish and had been bar mitzvah. So uh, with that, and, and I want to thank Len for agreeing uh, to give this webinar and I'll turn it over to you, Len, thanks. All right, uh, Larry, thanks. Um, you know, you talked about giving away some secrets that people didn't know. It. I'm glad you didn't talk about uh, the times that we actually had on the radio. <laughs> but we won't, we won't go into that. Yeah. Anyway, it's a pleasure and, a, and an honor to, to speak to you guys today. And, um, you know, I, I know that uh, some of my bio was essentially uh, was spoken just a moment ago, but, you know, I thought that we could probably kind of fill in some of the, some of the blanks and the gaps um, just, to, just to get started and through that, you know, talk about some issues, talk about some uh, uh, some events uh, that we all may have in common or, you know, some things that the, you guys don't know about, uh, particularly when it comes to college basketball, college sports, and um, some of the things that are trending today. But, you know, it, it all began for me uh, growing up in Brooklyn, New York. You know, I was uh, born and raised in uh, the Bed-Stuy and East New York section, we lived in public housing. My father was a uh, a new native of New York City uh, and didn't get past the 10th grade, uh, was a truck driver. My mother uh, was from a small town in Louisiana um, where she was actually the salutatorian in her high school and got a scholarship to go to uh, Southern University, a, a prominent HBCU, but uh, couldn't afford to do that because my grandparents lived on a, a sharecropper property and um, poor enough where my mother went to New York to stay with my aunt who was um, working so they could send money back home to my uh, to my grandparents and, and their other siblings. So education was really important, particularly to my mother. My father ultimately passed the civil servants test as did my mother and they ultimately became city, uh, city employees. My father for the Department of Sanitation and my mother was a clerk uh, for New York City, and we ultimately got to move out of that project to a small home in Queens. Um, you know, I, it was one of those homes in a neighborhood that was a striving neighborhood. Um, there was uh, 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 people who came from a lot of walks of life, primarily Black, although my, the projects where I lived actually were integrated. Um, you know, you were either Black or Jewish living in the boulevard houses back there in the 50s. But moving to Queens was a predominantly black neighborhood, small homes. Uh, I, I would say that we first learned how to mow the lawn. The lawn was probably as big as a postage stamp until we actually had to mow it. Then it looked like it was Central Park. Uh, but 
you know, that being the case in that neighborhood, uh, as I said, there are people who were uh, all city and state and, and federal employees, either Department of Sanitation, policemen, firemen, or um, postal workers. And, you know, it was a nice neighborhood, as I said, a striving neighborhood. But, um, you know, my experiences there had a lot to do with the dreams that, uh, you know, I looked to achieve. I spent a lot of time as a kid watching a lot of TV. I'm, I'm sure a lot of you guys did as well. My favorite shows happened to be shows like Perry Mason or The Defenders and shows like that. And, and during the times that, that, that I grew up, the civil rights movement was in full swing. Uh, the war in Vietnam uh, was just starting and the protests were just burgeoning. And, you know, I thought that I always wanted to be, um, you know, part of change, you know, part of progress, uh, rather than sit on the sidelines and watch the parade go by. And so, you know, my desire was to become a lawyer. Um, I, was, I was a baseball player, didn't play a lot of basketball. Matter of fact, didn't play any until uh, the ninth grade, and even then, that was just joking around in junior high. Uh, and once, once I had a, a, a PE substitute teacher watching me goof around with uh, my classmates and pulled me aside, because I was a little bit taller than everybody else, and said, you know, kid, you'd probably be better off playing with people closer to your size. And, you know, you saw me playing basketball. If, if any of you ever watched uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, do you remember Chief? Uh, that's probably what I looked like when I played basketball initially. Uh, but ultimately, I was asked to come down to this Catholic school in, uh, in Manhattan uh, by the name of Power Memorial Academy. Uh, I didn't know much about it except for this famous seven foot guy uh, whose name at the time was Lou Alcindor. And I said, sure, why not? Uh, ultimately, my parents convinced me that they could afford to pay the partial tuition that I, that I was offered and I'd get a great education. So I decided, okay, let's do it. Mm -hmm. And that's where I started to really take basketball seriously. Uh, for my sophomore year, I was in a learning mode and you know got embarrassed at times, but ultimately learned uh, the nuance of the game, the toughness of the game, and, and also learned the, to be really competitive in that particular type of environment. And by the time uh, I was a junior, I was all city senior. Uh, I was a high school All-American with two other guys. We were the first team ever to have three high school All-Americans on the same team. Also, we were named uh, national high school champions uh, in 1970. Uh, Power Memorial was a great experience, but not just for basketball. You know, I had uh, an opportunity to interact with some people, uh, particularly my lay teacher, who happened to be my basketball coach, taught me a lot about interacting with people. Um, you know, taught me a lot about, you know, the, the ability to listen and, and, and the ability really to, you know, accept other points of view, which I think has lasted uh, to this day. Uh, and, you know, I, I, Jack Cunard, who was my High school coach had passed away since then, but you know I'm indebted to him for for that type of experience. Uh, during the time, as I said, with our success in high school, I was getting recruited by an awful lot of teams. In fact, I would say that I probably could have gone to just about any uh, college in the country because I had uh, the academic qualifications to go, as well as uh, the basketball expertise and. You know, I, I narrowed it down. I probably wanted to stay in the Northeast, even though I've got uh, a lot of calls from schools in the South and out West. Of course, when John Wooden called, I said, I followed the guy once. I'm not going to follow him again, uh, speaking of Lou Alcindor. So, you know, that, that kind of ruled them out. And I would have had to compete with Bill Walton anyway. So that, that, wouldn't, have, that wouldn't have made, uh, it actually probably would have made me a better player. But, you know, I, I wrote them off to begin with. Of course, I was recruited by North Carolina, by Duke. And, you know, this is 1969, 1970. I went down to visit on a trip and, um, you know, realized that during that time, coming from where I came from, living in a more, more than integrated uh, environment, going down south at that period of time, it might have been great on campus uh, because there are a lot of New Yorkers and Northeasterners there. But what happens when I decide to step off campus? Um, with the attitudes and the understanding that I had. So literally had to turn 
them down and thought that I was going to go to St. John's. Uh, I became very close to Lou Conseca and his assistant coach, John Press. Uh, but between my junior and senior year, Lou Conseca decided that he was going to go coaching the pros. Uh, the New York Nets uh, were the ABA team. And Julius Irving was playing, I think, his first, his rookie year uh, that year. And, and Coach Conseca decided that's where he wanted to be. So I opened up the recruiting process all over again. And here comes Lefty Drizel, uh, the maximum uh, and, and the probably the utmost salesman uh, that you guys probably could have ever experienced. Certainly, I did. Lefty was a devotee of um, Dale Carnegie. So he had every saying in the book that related to sales, uh, related to self-improvement and self-awareness. And the one thing that uh, really impressed me about Lefty and his assistant coach, George Ravlin, was that the attention that you got. I, I can tell you guys that I literally got a letter every single day in the mail from some coach from that particular school. And they had four assistant coaches. So, you know, that that's something I think that probably was a, a chapter out of the Dale Carnegie book uh, to give, give the target an awful lot of attention. Uh, so I was sold and ultimately went down for a visit and, you know, enjoyed the fact that it was a an idyllic campus located between two major metropolitan areas, Washington, D.C. and Baltimore. And, you know, I figured that it was probably time to get away from home. And as you guys know, or many of you know, St. John's uh, is in Queens and literally was a half hour away from my house. I'm not sure how that would have turned out had I gone to St. John's. You know, it's too close to home. I probably would have stayed a mama's boy <laughs> up until, you know, the, the period of time where it took to grow up. But going to Maryland gave me a, a sense of independence, sense of, uh, of being on my own. But to make the decision, not only was I approached by a couple of folks like the Senator from the state of Maryland, Joe Tidings, uh, who knew I was interested in being a lawyer and gave me advice. But I also made up my mind, having gone to an all boys high school, I said to myself, okay, if the first 10 women on campus were good looking, I'm coming. And of course, you know, the, the, I don't have to say any more, Larry, you can attest to it, I think. You know, Maryland, Maryland had some attractive young ladies there, and that was something that uh, pushed me over the edge. But, you know, not to sound uh, sexist or anything like that, uh, I just laugh to this day. I ultimately met my wife on campus, so, you know, I can always say that, uh, you know, it, it, it had a reason. There was a purpose for me going to Maryland, so. But the experience was great. Um, you know, I... I certainly looked at that opportunity not only as a, a benefit to me with regard to a free education, but you know, also to meet people. And I still have friends, uh, not only as, as teammates who you know, I, I'm still in touch with and we're still rather close. Tom McMillan, who was a Rhodes Scholar at that time, an All-American like myself, uh, and, and a great player unto his own. He and I are still close over 51 years worth. Guys like John Lucas, Maurice Howard, for those of you who know anything about the, the Maryland basketball history, you know, we're all still close, Howard White. Um, just the, it's just a tremendous experience and the people that you met and my friends off campus as well. Um, I know someone uh, just mentioned in the chat that they're from Pikesville and, you know, I have some very close friends who are probably a generation before you uh, that uh, remain close friends to this day. So that, that's something that, you know, I'll always be indebted to my experience at Maryland for. Uh, but even more importantly, and we look at it today, I know today was the, um, the Supreme Court case, uh, Alston versus the NCAA. And, you know, it, it essentially comes down to, can the NCAA limit compensation to athletes? And the, one of the ways that we got to that point was that the, the plaintiffs who ultimately became the respondents you know, made the argument that, you know, this is labor and that the athletes aren't compensated enough. And, and true, the NCAA can do better in balancing the benefits based on the amount of revenues that they get. But to pay salaries, which ultimately would be the goal of, of this case, not directly, but indirectly, to pay salaries, I think would uh, be a huge mistake. Uh, you know, these guys and gals are not employees, in my opinion. 
and the way that uh, the, the proponents of paying them for performance, you know, gained traction and ultimately took over the, the narrative is to try to liken the idea of playing college sports as being labor. Now, when I played, that's the last thing we thought about that we were uh, workers, that we were employees. Sure, we went out and we practiced, uh, we worked hard, we risked injury uh, for that experience to, to play college basketball. But in exchange, we got a full scholarship, moon board, books, tuition, um, you know, a stipend. You know Len Elmore, the basketball coach? Yeah, of course. He's the, he's, the cool. guest. he's the guest tonight. Yeah, I am, as a matter of fact. If you guys want to mute so you can finish this. <laughs> anyway, um, but but I, I never thought of the uh, the experience as being labor. And, and that's what that, that's the difference today. The narrative has changed. Suddenly these guys and gals are workers. And that because people are making so much money off of the games that they deserve to be paid. Now I'm not a proponent of that because I know what the ultimate would be. Uh, the, the, the end game would ultimately be that, you know, they forget about school, that education wouldn't be the primary reason for them to be in college, but it would be to make a living for three or four years, forget about education. And that's not life-changing money that they would make any way, shape or form. Uh, so, you know, I, I, and I'll get to that later on as to what I'm doing with regard to those college issues, but I, I just wanted to relate that uh, today that, you know, during our era, we never thought of it as labor. Sure, we worked hard, but we were beneficiaries of a system that could provide a free education and an opportunity to move up the ladder of success in exchange for playing a game that we love. And I think that uh, that still holds true today, despite those who try to, you know, kind of poison the waters a little bit by liking in it to labor and you know making it sound a lot less fun and more ominous than it truly is but having said that uh the next step for me was a professional step and that was to play in the aba or the nba and as larry mentioned i wound up playing for the indiana pacers of the aba despite being drafted by the washington bullets in the nba and the biggest reason was money you know during that time uh, the mergers were proposed but hadn't been uh, hadn't been consummated. And uh, the NBA had a sense of arrogance that they thought that they were the league. And there was a fear among uh, draftees like myself that most of the ABA teams wouldn't survive. But my, my lawyer and I did some research and recognized how solvent the Indiana team was and that they would survive you know, any type of merger because of that financial solvency. And the honesty is that they offered me twice as much as the bullets offered. So I, I would have been stupid not to, to take the money uh, and to take the security. And then as my first couple of years in the NBA, you know, I had some success, um, you know, really started to move up. My first year was slow in, in my progress, but ultimately we got to the playoffs, upset a couple of teams. You know, I had a pretty good uh, playoff series and you know, we were kind of on our way. We wound up losing in the finals of the ABA to a Kentucky Colonels team that had Artis Gilmore, um, a guy by the name of Louis Dampier who played for um, the played for Kentucky University of Kentucky. Um, they had uh, you know a couple of other well-known players, but uh, we were essentially the underdogs, and we got to the finals. My next year, I averaged uh, almost 15 points and 11 rebounds, and thought I was on my way. And then the merger happened the following year. But in training camp, I tore ligaments in my knee and got to play, tried to come back and played six games. But, you know, I was never really the same and never put up the same numbers, which was a, a learning, a, a learning less, a lesson, a uh, learning experience, simply because I started to realize how important, you know, that education that I spoke of could be you know, in the event that I never played another game. Certainly, you know, I was making enough money where, you know, I could feel I could be stable for a while, but we didn't make anywhere near, as, as someone mentioned, we didn't make anywhere near what these guys make today. And at that time, um, you know, you had to rely on your opportunity uh, that you had in, in college. 
And so you got serious about plotting a career. Now I was able to, to recover, rehabilitate and played several more years for the Pacers before getting traded uh, to a team in Kansas City where I played for a while. I had a great opportunity to play with some young players like Phil Ford from North Carolina, um, you know, Otis Birdsong and, you know, some other, some other guys who, uh, Scott Wedman for uh, your Boston fans. I know Wed was a, a big fixture with the Celtics for a period of time. And, and you know, we, we did reasonably well. Ernie Grunfeld and I, that's when we first met and became uh, fast friends. Ernie from Forest Hills uh, played at the University of Tennessee. And, um, you know, ultimately we, we had some success, but, you know, as a free agent, I looked for even better opportunities and signed with the Milwaukee Bucks, who, uh, you know, that year we won uh, 60 games. And I played with guys like Sidney Moncrief and, um, you know, people, Brian Winters, Bob Lanier, uh, and one of the best players ever who probably should be in the Hall of Fame, Marcus Johnson. Um, so, you know, I, that experience in, in a small town like Milwaukee was probably the most fun because being a big fish in, in, in a small pond, people really appreciated what you did. And it was, um, it, it was an experience that I won't forget. I had probably the most fun as a pro player playing in Milwaukee. But needless to say, during that time, I was still dating my wife who, you know, we were getting married because she wanted to pursue a career in, in finance and banking. She graduated, went to the American School of International Management uh, down in, in Arizona. And, you know, I was still playing professional ball. Um, while I was in Milwaukee, her first job was in Chicago. And I'll tell you this story because of, of the idea of serendipity. Uh, while in Chicago, she's only an hour and a half from Milwaukee. We got to see each other a lot, um, as opposed to when I was in Indianapolis and she was in uh, living in College Park. But then she got transferred to New York City. Um, and lo and behold, a month later, I got traded to the New Jersey Nets right across the river. Uh, so you talk about serendipity, you talk about uh, a message. I don't believe there's any such thing as, as coincidence. So something told us, you know, it was kind of meant to be. But even then, uh, we, she didn't want to get married because she didn't want to marry an NBA player for maybe obvious reasons, who knows. Um, but we, we continued to stay together. And, and once I got to New Jersey, uh, we had a terrific team. Uh, started out very slowly because we had a young team coached by Larry Brown, who probably was the best pro coach I ever played for, uh, simply because he understood you know, how to get the most out of players. Uh, never asked them to do more than they're capable of doing, put them in positions where they can succeed. And again, I had the pleasure of playing with two other Turks. Albert King and Buck Williams. And we formed that Maryland front line, starting front line for the Nets uh, that lasted the whole year. We, I think we still, uh, as a trivial question, trivia question, we still have the record uh, for the most starts by three guys from the same team. And it was great when you were home or on the road and the PA announcer would announce your name and your school. And so every game, it was from the University of Maryland, number 55, Albert King, from the University of Maryland, number 52, Buck Williams, from the University of Maryland, number 41. And that was great to hear. Um, as I said, we started out two and 13, but we wound up winning 44 games uh, because the young team gelled with a bunch of old pros like myself, the great and late Ray Williams, um, you know, we had some guys from North Carolina, Michael Corrin, uh, from Duke, Mike Janinski. Uh, I'm sure some of you guys have heard those names. Um, and, and, you know, a couple of guys whose names aren't that famous, but certainly were integral uh, parts of our team. And, and that was another great experience. And being home in New York was great because, you know, my parents got to see me play on a regular basis uh, for those last three years. So two years with the Nets, finally got to... Uh, play for the New York Knicks, where I signed as a free agent. Um, and that was the year Bernard King really stepped out and you know, kind of uh, necessarily carried the team, although we had some great players. Uh, as I said, Ray Williams ultimately came back there. 
myself, we had Truck Robinson, uh, Bill Cartwright, Rory Sparrow, players like that. Uh, you know, we wound up losing to the Celtics um, in the uh, Eastern Conference semifinals, uh, seven game series that was close until that last game. But, uh, but the reason I mentioned that is because that was in my 10th year. And the year before I had realized with my knees hurting and, you know, getting older that it was time to start thinking about something else. And that's when I decided, okay, maybe now's the time to study for the LSATs, the LSAT, the aptitude tests that uh, law schools use to, you know, grade you in, as far as your uh, admissions uh, uh, potential. And so I took that during the summer, during the off season between uh, my ninth and 10th year. Um, and I applied to a bunch of law schools like the University of Maryland and others got accepted. But, you know, my girlfriend at the time, who now is my wife, challenged me. So why, why are you uh, applying to those schools? Why don't you apply to the best? And so she dared me to apply to Harvard. And I didn't think I was going to get in. I mean, I, I did pretty well in the LSATs, but Harvard. Anyway, I made my application, um, you know, filled it out, sent it in. And right then during the playoffs uh, that we're playing the Celtics, I get an acceptance letter, uh, which shocked the heck out of me. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I was pleased. Now I had a decision to make because I could defer a year. And I had an extra year on my contract with the Knicks. Or, you know, I could leave after this year, retire, and go to law school. So I made the decision when we were playing the Celtics, uh, I think it was game five. I was in Boston with nothing else to do. So I got on the tee, rode over to Cambridge and walked on campus and, you know, tried to decide what I was going to do. And after walking around the Harvard Square, and walking on campus, on the yard, and looking at the law school and going through the library, I just made up my mind, that was it. I would forego that last year with the Knicks and it was time to go to law school. And, and I think it was a, it was a decision that uh, was probably the right one for me because of the pain, uh, because of the fact that I wasn't playing as much anymore because I was getting a lot older. Uh, it was something else to jump into, a, a career pursuit that took me in a different direction, but nevertheless, it was a direction that, that, that I certainly needed. So. Spent three years, obviously, in Cambridge. Uh, did a lot of public interest work as well as uh, with my studies. I represented tenants and landlord-tenant uh, disputes. I was uh, working for the public defender uh, for a couple of years as an intern, and you know, learned a lot about people. Uh, learned a lot about you know folks who don't have the same access uh, to you know legal uh, expertise that. Uh, most people who are middle class and above would. I also learned a lot about the criminal justice system and realized its shortcomings and you know, its needs. Uh, and I was gonna be a, a, a public defender, defense attorney until one day in court, you know, as a public defender, I'm representing a guy who was accused of aggravated rape. And we looked at the facts and realized that you know, this isn't right that he shouldn't have been charged with aggravated rape, which included forcible utilizing a weapon, et cetera. But in order to prove that, they had a preliminary hearing uh, where third year law students could conduct preliminary hearings. And it was my job to tear the witness's story down. Now you can imagine how any normal, reasonable person would feel having to put a, a young woman who had been victimized through that kind of interrogation. But you know, ultimately, I was successful in doing it. I uh, got the charges placed where they were supposed to be, and felt like, like, like shit, obviously, in, in doing so. And my um, my supervisor pulled me aside and said, "Look, I know how you feel. Um, defense attorneys are reactive. You have to react to, you know, the charges and the situation. Uh, if you were a prosecutor, though." you could set the tone. You know, if you were the prosecutor in this case, you would have charged properly and we wouldn't have to go through this and the victim wouldn't have to go through this. And that's when I made up my mind, that's the side I needed to be on. Uh, so why did I choose Brooklyn, New York? Uh, simply because there was a case that spoke to jury discrimination and how the prosecutors 
uh, got too much leeway in, in forming juries that were discriminatory, particularly against black defendants. And I recognize that um, in Batson versus Kentucky, which was uh, an opinion by Thurgood Marshall that essentially said that, you know, you have to now put the prosecutors to a test or any lawyer to a test as they try to build a jury that is, you know, of one race, uh, particularly all white juries against a defendant of the opposite race. And the only prosecutor who filed an amicus brief in favor of, of that type of limitation on prosecutors was Elizabeth Holtzman, who was the district attorney in Brooklyn, New York. And I said to myself, you know what, I can work for her. And so that's, you know, how it began. You know, I was a prosecutor for four and some odd years. Uh, one of my um, essential assignments was I prosecuted police misconduct. And, you know, in today's world, when we see the, the case uh, where Derek Chauvin accused of, uh, of killing George Floyd and recognizing the police brutality that's gone on, that's brought us to this flashpoint in America today, you know, I, I realize that not a whole lot has changed from the days when I prosecuted police misconduct until today. And that's the sad part about it. Um, but, you know, I, I continued on, uh, couldn't be a lifetime prosecutor, or a career prosecutor because didn't make enough money. And my wife and I had gotten married, uh, raising a child in Manhattan. Um, and, you know, she had just gotten started working on Wall Street. And so, you know, it was time for me to go out and make a real living. Fortunately, I had an opportunity to do television since my second year of law school. And, um, you know, I became a broadcaster as well as an attorney. That was, one of them was my sideline. I couldn't decide which one that was really considered my career. Uh, but, you know, I, I started to build a name as, a, as an announcer. And uh, I guess the pinnacle of my career was the Kentucky Duke game, which a lot of people consider the greatest game, college basketball game played. Although those of you who might remember in Maryland versus NC State uh, back in uh, 1974, my senior year, when we were the number three team in the country and NC State was number one, and we were playing for the right to go to the NCAA tournament because only one team could go from, um, from the ACC. Uh, the Kentucky Duke game had its suddenness because of the way it ended with Leitner's big shot. Um, and, and that was comparable to the suddenness of our game where we lost and the number three team in the nation went home. Uh, the number one team in the nation went on to win the national championship, but said that the toughest team they ever played was the number three team, us, University of Maryland. Small solace because the following year, the NCAA expanded the field. So something like that, uh, an aberration like that would never occur again. Um, you know, the only thing I guess we can hang our hats on is the fact that by losing, we changed history. Uh, either way, that game would have been historical. But the Kentucky Duke game was one of those, uh, if you remember that, you know, kind of set the tone. They had players who were kind of models for the way the game was played thereafter. In the, in the 90s and early 2000s, um, you know, had mobile big men who could shoot the ball from outside as well as play well inside, you know, terrific guard play, excellent all around players like Grant Hill and Jamal Mashburn. And that game just went back and forth. And as I said, the suddenness when Grant Hill throws the ball three quarters of the court to Leitner and Leitner turns and hits that shot at the buzzer to win the game. Um, you know, so many people remember that. And Vern Lundquist, my partner, and I, I guess we go down in history as, as, as having the, the honor to, to be able to call that game. And I guess we did a pretty good job because we don't get much criticism about the way we called it. Uh, although I'm sure that, you know, somebody has something to say, probably a Duke fan more than anything else. But you know, be that as it may, that was kind of the highlight of the career. And, and you know, I went on up until uh, two years ago, did the NCAA tournament for about 25 years. I was a broadcaster for over 30 years, uh, kind of slowed down uh, right now to the point where, you know, I'm just doing uh, essentially some Big Ten stuff. Uh, with COVID this year, I refused to travel. So you didn't see me much in any games that I did. It was because I did them from my basement at my house in Maryland, where the Big Ten Network sent a bunch of monitors and a camera and 
lights and everything. And, and actually I could do games sitting in the comfort of my own home. Uh, so, you know, that was a wonderful experience unto itself. And so, as I said, I practiced law for uh, about 25 years. Uh, among the experiences I had was also as a sports agent. You know, in five years as a sports agent, uh, I represented uh, seven first round picks in the NBA, a couple of high draft choices in the NFL, uh, an Olympic gold medal gymnast, a couple of Olympic gold medal track and field stars. Uh, got a great deal of satisfaction in helping uh, these young people at the time really move on with their careers and be successful afterwards. But I left the business simply because because of basketball, particularly the business got so dirty as the money got bigger, uh, the, the um, essentially the, the misfeasance and the malfeasance of, of agents out there became uh, more prevalent um, to the point where agents were offering guys money to allow them to, to represent them, which I thought was antithetical to what it was all about. I mean, if you're a dentist, would you pay a client uh, to, to, be your, to be your patient and vice versa as a patient. If a dentist offered you money to provide a service, you know, why would you go with that dentist? But that was what was going on in that business. And I figured you know, I had a, um, a, a law degree and uh, I was admitted to the bar. I wasn't gonna risk that uh, by doing underhanded stuff. So I got out of the business. The thing that really pushed me was representing Joe Smith. I don't know if you guys, I know Joe Smith was the number one pick in the draft, a Maryland player, um, a great player, but you know he had family who essentially swayed uh, too much influence over him to the point where you know they were too busy listening to other people promise them the moon. Uh, one particular agent promised that he'd be the next one hundred million dollar player because this guy represented uh, Kevin Garnett at the time. And you know that uh, kind of opened the eyes of the family, not realizing that that was never going to happen. But you know the family convinced Joe to fire me, go with this guy, which he did. And Joe was the rookie of the year. You know we had a deal on the table where he could make you know sixty million dollars over a four year period. If he did well, he could sign another sixty million dollar contract or more. Uh, but you know that that wasn't within their calculus. And so they go with the guy who promised them to be the next $100 million player. And ultimately, they got caught. Uh, they were conspiring with the team, which was the Minnesota Timberwolves, the general manager, Kevin McHale, um, and wound up not only getting the lawyer, the, the agent disbarred and losing his license to be an agent, Kevin McHale got suspended and the Minnesota Timberwolves lost five first round draft picks because they tried to circumvent the cap. And Joe Smith never became the player uh, that we thought he'd wind up being. And to this day, I don't know if you guys watched CNBC last year, a special show with uh, Alex Rodriguez and Joe Smith. Joe Smith admitted he had $6,000 left in his checking account after making you know, at least $40, $50 million as a, uh, as a professional athlete. And all because of the wrong guidance, because of undue influence by family members and others who constantly had their hands in his pocket. And, you know, that's the shame. The one thing I can say is I can look at all the players that we did, in fact, represent. Every single one of them has money. They're gainfully employed. They're smart in their investing. And, you know, that's something that I'm truly proud of. So, you know, at least I had some positive impact. Uh, today, um, as I get you know, towards the end of, you know, my story and, and hopefully get some questions from you guys and I see a bunch of them there. Today, I uh, decided that, you know, I've amassed all this institutional knowledge in so many different areas that, you know, at, at the age of 69, which I turned last, this past Sunday, you know, what am I gonna do with it? You know, I can't take it with me. So I decided that, uh, you know, maybe I, I can teach in a sports management program um, developed a, a couple of uh, classes that were attractive to Columbia University, joined their faculty. Uh, this is my third year as, a, um, as an instructor, a senior lecturer at Columbia University in the sports management program, hopefully teaching the, the leaders of tomorrow in the business of sport. And, you know, I find it truly fulfilling. Um, it, it 
it kind of also satisfies my curiosity and, and my desire to, you know, exercise those academic chops that, that I think I've always had. And, and it's been fun. I still uh, also stay close to the game of college sports. Um, and that has to do with my position as co-chair of the Knight Commission. And if anybody's really interested in what the Knight Commission for Intercollegiate Athletics does, uh, check us out at knightcommission.org. Um, you know, we over the last several decades have uh, really been at the forefront of reform in college sports, trying to make sure that college sports remains part of the education mission uh, with regard to universities and institutions. And, and it doesn't become, uh, you know, what we consider professional sports. Although, as I said, the Austin case today is going to be a major hurdle uh, to prevent that from happening. Uh, but, you know, I, I feel committed simply because, again, my, my success, I owe a great deal of it to uh, the opportunity that I got through college sports and being able to attend uh, the University of Maryland. So, you know, I, I, I really just want to emphasize that, you know, with, uh, with young people today, uh, you just try to make sure that, you know, they understand the concept of opportunity that, you um, the concept of being ready, prepared for opportunity when it comes. Um, and, you know, I use people say that, why can't we somehow find a way uh, to predict the future and, uh, and have the future instruct? And I tell them that, you know, those people like me, we are the instructors of the future because we're no different than many of the kids today. And our experiences, our errors, uh, and mistakes, as well as our triumphs, uh, are, are lessons, learning lessons that can be passed on. The question is whether young folks are going to listen. And in the university uh, where I teach, I found a, a, a huge number of young people who, in fact, are listening. And that's extremely important. So, um, you know, we'll find them not only in a university setting, but everywhere we go. I'm sure each one of you have had an opportunity to play some positive role in the experience of, of young people who, you know, desire to emulate and, and be, you know, what many of you are. And I would say, don't stop uh, that effort, that it's an ongoing effort and that they truly need you. I'm the father of two boys who are Ivy League educated, um, have post, postgraduate degrees. One was a, a college athlete, a baseball player at Princeton and get his master's at, got his master's at the Citadel and played basketball there. The other is a Columbia undergrad and Columbia Business School grad. And they recognize the value of education, but they can also enjoy sports equally as much. So, you know, from that standpoint, my wife and I are very proud of, of what we've been able to accomplish with them. So, you know, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. I see there are a lot of questions. Um, you have a lot of questions, Lance. So um, you guys, you guys want to... Um, moderate that yeah you know. I'll, I'll 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 feed you the questions and sure. we asked you to speak for 45 minutes it's 8 46 so that's pretty good yeah i, I was i was checking the time out I figured it was <laughs> enough there. so uh so just uh it actually the question started before the webinar someone wants you to know that he lives in pikesville maryland and that he misses coalfield house and his son goes to maryland so the question from one of our other participants is why Mitch Kassoff went to Maryland when you should have gone to a smaller school? Well, you know, I, I know Mitch is Mitch Kassoff. And, you know, I, I think Mitch was, uh, he was one of those big fish in a relatively small pond. You know, he was a star, I think, at Pikesville High uh, and, you know, thought that he could probably play in Maryland, not realizing that you know, it was a different breed of, of athlete, uh, you know, far from, you know, the suburban Maryland high school. Mitch was, Mitch was a great athlete. Uh, it's just that, you know, particularly for basketball, he just wasn't uh, as skilled. But, you know, look, he had a great experience. And from time to time, Mitch, are in, uh, he and I are in, in contact because, you know, I got to know him. He went to school with my sisters-in-law. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of like a big, happy family there. But that, you know, that was the, the choice he made and he wasn't gonna become a pro, but yet he got to be uh, part of a, you know, a winning experience at the University of Maryland. And I'm sure if he were here, 
uh, to talk about it. He's got some great stories, great memories, and he's got his degree. All right. So here's a question. Back in 1970 to 71, the JV team went undefeated. And the question is, do you stay in contact with the members of that team? Yeah, actually, it was a freshman team. And, you know, all those guys, uh, there a number of them who did not go on to play on the varsity because they weren't scholarship players. But, you know, there are a couple of guys who are uh, still close friends. Um, and the, the bottom line is that, that that's what I was talking about earlier with regard to my experience there to have friendships that last that long. I mean, you know, our families, one in particular, Paul Ahern, who was a point guard for the team. You know, he, his wife and my wife were extremely close till she passed away. And, you know, Paul's been part of our family. His son and my son grew up together. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it was truly a, a happy family. And, um, you know, we lost a couple of guys from that team as well. And, you know, it's heartbreaking. But nevertheless, you know, we, uh, we, we remained close because we had that, uh, that common ground. That was uh, the success that we had. And, and that's true in, in life. Um, you know, whether it's the military or any other area where a group, you know, has to work closely together for a common goal. Um, you remain close because you've all sacrificed for the benefit of each other. Wow. So, Len, we took you from 1970, and now I'm going to take you to yesterday. So <laughs> someone wants to know, what do you think of the non-foul call at the end of the UConn-Baylor game last night? Um, honestly, I did not see it live. Um, uh, and I actually, I didn't even see the UCLA Michigan game. I'll be honest. I went to sleep. I was tired, uh, <laughs> but, but I saw pictures of it. And if in fact, you know, the, the picture, that ball had not left that individual's hand when they got hit, that was a foul, but I couldn't tell, you know, if after the ball had left the hand and then there was contact. I could see where the officials wouldn't call a foul. So, you know, it really depends. I didn't see the videotape in live action. So, you know, it's not a way to skirt the issue. It's just that, you know, I sure. didn't have enough evidence. Makes sense. It wasn't, wasn't conclusive evidence for me to overturn the call. You sound like a lawyer. Or a referee, one of the two. <laughs> <laughs> so a question that would definitely interest this group, Ernie Grunfeld, who I actually grew up watching, did you ever see him experience any anti-Semitism on or off the court? Um, you know what? I, I, he may have. Uh, I didn't see it. I mean, we, we lived in Kansas City for a while, honestly. And, you know, that still is somewhat of a hotbed for, you know, not only anti-Semitism, but racism as well um, in some way, shape or form. But by the same token, there are a lot of really quality people out there. I'm sure Ernie can tell you that more. As a player, among all of us, I don't think he ever experienced uh, anything like that simply because obviously we're in a league that, um, you know, so many people are experiencing that. Uh, but, but there's no question. I'm sure when he went to Tennessee, he probably ran into it. Uh, it's, you know, it, it comes uh, being black and Jewish, being black or Jewish, it comes with the territory. You know, I taught my kids that a long time ago. Um, and, you know, they've, they've adjusted really well. They understand what we're going to as a nation at this moment. Um, and, you know, they, they've heard the stories. They've spoken to people like Ernie and others. So, um, you know, they get it. But as far as Ernie's experience is concerned, I'm sure he did in some way, shape, or form. We're talking the 70s. Uh, but, you know, I don't know of any specific instances, no, certainly not around me, because I wouldn't stand for it anyway. Excellent. So to change topics, did you ever play at the Palestra? At the Palestra? Did I play? Um, no, I didn't. I've done some games from it, but never, never played. played. So, yeah, I mean, um, you know, actually, let me, I think in high school, during the summers, we may have played in a tournament there, um, but never in a college game, and certainly you know, that was a college arena, never in a pro game. So one of our um, regional presidents, who thank God was uh, in the hospital and now 
is out and on his road to recovery. Right. He wants you to know that he was at the Spectrum in 1992. Ah, at that game? <laughs> at that game. Wow, yes, that's great. Actually, my, uh, my oldest son was there. Uh, my wife brought him down on the train. It was my birthday, March 28th, 1992, my 40th birthday. And I think that's where my oldest son developed his love of basketball. Um, I think he was two years old, sitting on her lap. And when everybody started cheering, he'd get up and start raising his hand, you know, doing what kids do at the time. So I, that, that was a game that, that got everybody, no matter which side you were rooting for, it got everybody excited. It was, it was a terrific experience. So Len, here, um, I'll let you use your lawyerly skills as well as your uh, basketball skills. What do you think of the current positionless game in today's NBA versus the era that you played in? Well, I mean, when you say positionless, I'm not so sure that that's the case, at least for, you know, the three players, the three skilled players, the so-called point guard, uh, shooting guard, small forward. I mean, they're they're relatively interchangeable. You still need people to rebound, uh, but from a skill standpoint, particularly as big men are concerned, to have big men stepping out and shooting threes on a consistent basis, you know, I, I just I just don't see it. And, and what's that's that's been influenced by analytics, you know, analytics that essentially say that um, you know the three point shot. Obviously, if you shoot forty percent, that's the equivalent of sixty percent of twos. Um, that the, uh, the mid-range shot is not worth it. You might as well try for a layup or step back. But but you know that's not um, that that's not encompassing the totality of the strategy of basketball, which is to get the defense out of position. And you can't create really good threes if you don't shoot mid-range shots and and become a threat inside the three-point line that makes the defense honor your ability to get there leaves more room for you to shoot outside. You know, I also get incensed when I see guys driving to the basket, literally with an opportunity to shoot a layup, but yet pass it back outside, taking what is considered and, and the probability a 90% shot or an opportunity to get fouled for two shots and throw it out to a three, which is probably about 35%, depending on where you're shooting from. It, to me, and all for one extra point. And you see that happen over and over in the game of basketball uh, where teams don't put enough pressure on the defenses. You know, in, in the short term uh, and even in the long term, teams can have success, you know, saturating with threes. But when it comes to championship play, I'll use the Houston Rockets as an example. You know, they would never win a championship utilizing that, uh, that strategy because that that's shot is not going to stay with you on a consistent basis. And unless you're a lockdown uh, defensive team night in, night out, you're gonna have some problems and, and certainly it's proven. Uh, so, you know, I like the idea of, you know, interchangeability, the, the skill level of these players is beyond the skill level of the guys that, uh, that I played for and the generation I played with. But, uh, but I think the basketball IQ in determining when to take certain shots putting pressure on the defense, things like that, that's lacking. I think too many times teams settle for threes instead of working uh, to make it better. And when you look at rebounding, you know, people talk about a guy who's got 15 rebounds in a game. Nobody offensive rebounds anymore. Very few do. And so from that standpoint, once a shot goes up, the offensive team is now retreating back on defense. There's nobody to contest the defense and rebounding. So those rebounds just drop in your lap. And, and I've always said that the measure of a quality rebounder is, is offensive rebounding, not defensive rebounding. And so, you know, from that standpoint, and the lack of skill with the back to the basket, how many centers today get down on a low block that can help out a team by throwing it inside, make moves inside, and score from inside? Most of them make their points either from shooting outside, particularly, you know, some of the European guys, from beyond the three, or they're getting points after penetration and somebody dishes to them for a dunk. Nobody has a skill level like a Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, you know, a Bob Lanier, a Robert Parrish, and guy, Kevin McHale, 
guys who have a uh, game inside, inside the paint. We don't see that much. And I fault the lack of big men coaches in the college game to be able to teach that. So Lan, we have enough questions here to keep you busy for the next half an hour. So I'm going uh -huh. to uh, have to unfortunately edit a few, but there's one that I really, really like, and I'm gonna ask it now. So as a former announcer, does it bother you to hear the horrible grammatical errors by today's oh. announcement announcers as it went down the court? Ah, uh, I would tell you something, man. You must have been, you must have read my mind several times when I watched these games. You know, I, I when my kids were listening back in the day when they were younger, there were certain guys that wouldn't allow them to listen to it. So um yeah, it, it bothers me a lot, but that's unfortunate, the, the accepted parlance in, in, in today's media. Uh, it's not about skill. In many instances, it's about having a name that people recognize, being able to tell a joke. And, you know, there are certain guys whom I love because I've known them for so long. A guy like Bill Raftery actually did my games uh, on television when I was playing for the Nets. Um, you know, Raft is terrific, but, you know, Raft, can get on my nerves when he talks about dribble drive. That is the most redundant phrase in basketball. How the hell else are you going to drive unless you dribble? <laughs> Think about it. You know, dribble drive. I, it, you know, those. that's, you know, one example of, of a lot of things that, you know, kind of get on my nerves. But I'm not in the business anymore. And, you know, I'm not one to criticize colleagues. You know, I leave that for other people. But, but yeah, there are things that get on my nerves. Uh, grammatical errors as well as redundancy. So, oh, oh, the other thing is when he scores the basketball, what else are you going to score? <laughs> but let's listen to guys sometimes. You, well, he does a great job of scoring the basketball. What did he score? His uh, his, his headband? <laughs> no. Anyway, I mean, I can I can do if, if you guys are ready to go at nine, I'm good. You know, I can do another five ten minutes if you got questions. Okay, then I, I do have. Well, there's several questions. Um, okay, then I'll I'll ask you a somewhat serious one. I have a this is a, from again from one of our listeners is a question about the Len bias situation. Did you ever get to speak to the players and Lefty, and how do you think that affected Lefty and the program? Um, yeah, I did get to speak to the players. I was on the task force in, in the aftermath of, of that whole tragedy uh, to speak to the players experience and you know what what could have led to the fact that none of these things could be detected and you know I, I spoke to some of the players and you know they kind of intimated uh, to some extent uh, uh, that what they were speaking to with regard to Len's experience it wasn't the first time See, all too many people were saying that was the first time. That wasn't the first time he was experimenting in that area. And so, you know, that, that was something that I, I could figure out. And, you know, other people could figure out having, you know, seen and been around as a pro and, and seeing the experiences that people have had. Um, the impact on, on, the, uh, on the program was profound. Um, you know, obviously, the lefty for, you know, a year or so after that, had a tight rein on the team, constant vigilance. Um, players obviously were afraid to communicate with media particularly, uh, but you know overall it, it just it just brought uh, set the program back for a long period of time. The difficulty is that it, it wasn't Lefty's fault. People wanted to blame the coach, but it wasn't a coach's fault. You know, but they needed a scapegoat. Um, you know, at the time Dr. Slaughter uh, and, and others who were uh, in charge of the university, Slaughter was the president. You know, we're pushing for Lefty's resignation, and you know, Lefty's a fighter. He, he tried to fight it, but eventually, um, you know, couldn't outlast uh, the detractors. So, you know, as I said, and then to hire Bob Wade, who you know was a was a good coach, X and O's coach, but he couldn't handle the um, the breadth and the dimension of being a Division One college coach. And he made a ton of mistakes. The biggest mistake was he never really enlisted allies. You know, he tried to push many of us ex-players and stuff. He pushed us away from the program. And so, you know, when you're hired in a controversial situation and you don't develop allies uh, with some power and authority, um, you're going to be, the moment you have some issue, 
you're going to be in trouble. You're going to be, you know, without a base of support. And that's what happened to Bob Wade. You know, unfortunately, Gary Williams came along and helped resurrect the program. But, you know, when Lefty left, the, the program was going to be in dire straits for a couple of years. So, you know, it, again, the tragedy uh, to the family and the loss of the life uh, far outweighs uh, what happened to the program. But nevertheless, you know, it, it set the program back forever. And, and one of the things that, you know, makes me really think that puzzles me and when people talk about how great Lynn Bias might have been as a player, he had, he was the best player that ever go to the University of Maryland, in my opinion. But if he had those issues and he took them to the pros, those issues would have been exasperate, exacerbated um, simply because of the uh, because of the money, uh, access to money and access to so many of those things and the lack of oversight uh, when you become a pro. You're on your own. And that's what I would have been very fearful of, uh, you know, had I known that that was the case with him. So, you know, we'll never know. And it, it's a tragedy that he's gone because he was a great person. He just made a mistake. <clears throat> Eric, time for a couple of more. This, I think, is a really interesting. What is your thoughts about Larry Brown being on the staff at IU with Michael Woodson? Um, I, I know both of those guys. Woody is a friend and has been a friend for a long time. And Larry being there, it's, I don't know, it's going to be hard for Larry to take the back seat uh, with, if, he, if he gets that opportunity. It would be hard for him to take a back seat and allow Woody to be you know, the man, so to speak. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's great. Larry Brown is, is an outstanding teacher. And as I said before, um, you know, his philosophy of putting people in positions to succeed, not asking them to do more than they're capable of doing, and repetition in practice constantly so that when you're in a game situation, you're not overwhelmed. I, I think that works extremely well, regardless of, you know, the level that you're playing. In. And Larry's won at every level. Uh, world championship in the NBA, national championship in college. He's won championships over in Europe. Um, you know, the only guy that's comparable, and, and this guy never really won an NBA championship, is Rick Pitino, who has won on every level too. He was another great teacher. Uh, but but if Larry, in fact, is going to be on that um, on that staff, it's reminiscent of what Michigan has done. You know, they hire a guy who. Uh, played for them, who is true blue, bleeds blue, and, and Juwan Howard, who had pro experience as a coach. And what they do is they hire a guy like Phil Martelli to be kind of his bench coach, his, his sage, if you will, uh, you know, to help him through those, those moments uh, when, you know, you need that experience. And so, you know, following that prototype, uh, I think Indiana is probably going to have some success very quickly. A um, couple more questions, and uh, I really like this one. Can you comment on the role that you'd like to see current college and NBA players play as activists, looking at examples of individuals such as Seth Towns? Yeah, I, I, I think that the platforms these young people have today and the followings uh, of those platforms makes them highly influential. And I think it's really important that as people have put so much They've invested so much emotionally in sports that you know it, it just follows that these athletes, you know, see that they have a responsibility. Now, to what extent are they going to take it? I mean, there's there's the performative aspect where they can talk a good game. Um, you know, there's uh, the aspect where they get involved. Uh, a lot of guys will you know uh, pro provide funds, resources for things that are going to help. Um, advanced social justice. I mean, people talk about LeBron doing a lot of things, and that's great. And then there are others who literally are going to force action. Um, and we can see that happening, reminiscent of the days when, um, you know, Tommy Smith and John Carlos raised their fists, when Muhammad Ali uh, sat out and lost his heavyweight championship uh, because he was a conscientious objective to the war in Vietnam. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of uh, folks who can, and, and then you have Colin Kaepernick, who's been blackballed because he decided to take a knee, all again to highlight uh, the treatment uh, of people, uh, people of color by police uh, 
treatment of, of the criminal justice system and the need for reform, et cetera. You know, there, there are so many ways you can go. Uh, I think some of these athletes can force a, a work stoppage, which according to an executive in one of the, the, the most prominent professional sports league who told me and told my class, the only thing that the owners understand is business disruption. You know, and one of the purposes for business disruption is to get owners to pledge. If you have lobbyists who are gonna get you tax breaks, who are gonna get you zoning law changes, who are gonna get you so many things in state, city, state, and federal legislature, legislatures, um, you know, you need to have them uh, also apply those, those lobbyists to getting things like qualified immunity dropped, to getting changes in the criminal justice system. And if you don't do it, we're not gonna play. But that's going to require unity, and the one what? thing, the one thing that the owners have as a as an advantage is they're paying these guys so much money, and very few of them are willing to walk away from the amount of money they're getting paid in order for uh, in order for them to stand up for a particular cause. There are very few Colin Kaepernicks in the world out there, so we'll see what happens. But absolutely, I, I think it's good that they're starting to understand the platforms that they have, and they can speak out against social injustice, regardless of where it is. Excellent, excellent answer. All your answers have been very insightful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, so I have one more okay. uh, basketball one and then I, I'll wrap it up. So does Turgeon get a contract extension vis-a-vis -vis the hit to recruiting versus his inability to advance to the final four? Well, <laughs> uh, you know, I consider Mark a friend, I, I can see both sides of it. Uh, I would say from a recruiting standpoint, uh, his guys need to do an even better job of recruiting players from the DMV, from the uh, District Maryland and, and Virginia area. Look how many of those guys escaped. The most prominent one of the last year is the center for Michigan, Hunter Dickinson, you know, who was all Big Ten uh, and says Maryland never really approached him. Uh, he went to DeMatha. Um, you know, we've lost a lot of guys. Uh, a couple of them were top choices in, in the NBA. But the, the flip side of that is some of those guys are also destined to be one and done players. And you don't build a program by recruiting just one and done. So you can see what's happened to Duke and Carolina and some of the other who actually, you know, have now had to reload when they haven't had to do that for a while. Uh, but by the same token, I can also see how people are you know, not satisfied. Maryland has all the resources, not necessarily to have to be a blue blood, but certainly to be a highly competitive team. Um, and yet, you know, we can't get past Sweet 16, you know, in 10 years. So, you know, I, I could see the dissatisfaction. And people can say maybe enough is enough, time to try something different. Um, so, you know, there are arguments for both sides. And the question is, you know, from a financial standpoint, where does Maryland stand? Uh, can they sign them to a couple of years and, and have a contract that, you know, allows them to, you know, to, to part ways with them without costing them a buyout? Uh, they may have the leverage to do that. Or can they go out there and look on the market right now and find that person? Is that person out there at the moment who can do exactly what Maryland needs them to do? And let's take them to the next level with regard to NCAA appearances and, and survival. So, uh, tough decision for Damon Evans. I don't envy him, um, but you know sometimes uh, you know you, you stay with what you have until you find something better. All right. Well, we're overwhelmed with all your knowledge. I'm certainly <laughs> impressed. You you have not just an answer, but you had quite insightful answers for every one of these questions. Someone from the Midwest, from Indiana, wants you to be on the Dan Daches show if you ever get a chance. Someone else, Dan asked, Dock, Dan yeah, Dockin show. I guess, uh, yeah. Dan Never and I of, would get into a few arguments. If we were there up. you go. Uh, someone here else says you you should consider being a coach. Someone else wants to know um, what's the name of your website again? Oh, Night Commission, nightcommission.org. dot org. K n i g h k n i g h t commission dot org. Okay. That's uh, yeah, but the night commission is just not me. It's it's been in in service for you know several decades. Started by uh, the late Reverend Dr. Theodore Hesburgh from Notre Dame and and some other 
you know, highly uh, respected people in business and in academics who fully understand the need for reform. Because yeah, college sports is a public trust. You know, it galvanizes communities, it provides opportunity. And, you know, and it's something obviously that we all love and it needs to be saved sometimes from itself uh, because there is the element of greed and the element of excess that exploits the college athletes as well as, you know, prevents it from being part of the education mission and turns it into pure naked commercialism. And, you know, we need to be able to draw the line in, in many of those ways to save it from itself. So, you know, hopefully people will read it and can, can support uh, some of the things that uh, the Knight Commission stands for. So, uh, Larry, we are very, very indebted to you for getting us uh, our guest tonight. So thank you. March 28th is your birthday, Len? Yep. That's when it was. <laughs> That's Larry's son's birthday also. Oh, is that right? Okay. Yeah. So there you go. So next time you have a birthday, you guys can get together and talk about that. <laughs> and I guess to wrap up, um, so we're a very large organization of Jewish men's clubs from all over the country. And our international president wants you to know that he went to high school with Mark Cartwright. Oh, you, my goodness, Mike. And you were the public enemy number one. When you beat him out for center. <laughs> no, Mark, uh, and I, I was sorry to hear that Mark had passed, um, but no, he was a good guy. He, he, obviously, Lefty filled his head with a lot of things, but, uh, you know, he had to realize. I thought Tom McMillan was the enemy because he thought he was closer to Tom than he was to me with regard to talent and stuff, but that's neither here nor there. But Mark was a, he was a terrific person. We really enjoyed it. He actually transferred. Uh, so I didn't get a chance to play varsity with him. So I'll just wrap up. Everyone is saying, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We loved it. We loved it. And the final comment, my vote, the next Maryland coach, Len Elmore. Thank uh, you I appreciate much. that. I'm, I'm a little too old for that, though, but I'll, I'll still be a, an interested fan like the rest of you guys. Thank you all. Uh, truly enjoyed it. And um, maybe we'll see each other down the road. Yeah. And thank you very much, Lynn. I really appreciate you giving it to us. Sure. Thank you. All right, thank everybody. You. Take care. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank we'll you. See, we'll see everyone next Tuesday night. We have another sports webinar. Hey, good uh, night. Yeah. Good night, everyone. That was, that was great. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go.